Welcome to Evaporation and Vapor Pressure. You may have had the experience of boiling water yourself, either on a stove or in lab. If you have, you've probably noticed something that looks like this. You see bubbles coming up through the liquid, you see steam rising out of the container, and over time you would probably also notice that the water level goes down. There's no real mystery in that. You're adding energy to the liquid, it's becoming a gas, and it's escaping the container. So the water level decreases because the water is leaving the container in the form of steam. However, if you take a cup of water, such as this one, and you leave it out for a few days at normal temperature, you'll also see the water level come down. We call this phenomenon evaporation. But what exactly is evaporation? We didn't add any heat to that cup of water, and we didn't see any steam coming out of it. So where did the water go, and what is evaporation? Well, evaporation is the process of a liquid becoming a gas without boiling. Now that part should make sense because we didn't add any heat and we didn't see any steam coming out. So there's no boiling going on. So let's examine the molecules in that cup of water. Here I have my cup of water. And in my cup of water there are all these molecules of water at the surface. So these are molecules of liquid. Now what's happening with evaporation is that every now and then one of these molecules escapes the liquid. So every now and then we get a couple molecules that are able to escape the liquid surface and they become a gas and they eventually leave the container. And after enough time has gone by this results in a lowering of the amount of water in the cup. So we see the water level come down just like we did with that picture of the cup of water. Well how can this happen? How can some molecules at any given temperature randomly break free of the liquid and escape into the gaseous state and then leave the container. Well remember that temperature represents the average kinetic energy of a sample. So at some temperature we have a range of kinetic energies. So some molecules are moving very fast and some molecules are moving very slow. In fact if you remember the energy diagram which relates the kinetic energy to the number of molecules in the sample. So there's a distribution of different kinetic energies amongst all the molecules, and that distribution looks like this. Now the average kinetic energy, that's what the temperature tells us, the average is represented right around here. Here's the average kinetic energy, and that's what we get temperature from. But you'll notice there's a small portion of molecules way out here this section right here, this number of molecules way out here, that has a very high kinetic energy. And it's that portion that have enough kinetic energy, meaning they're moving fast enough, to escape the liquid. If those molecules with this high kinetic energy randomly end up near the surface, there's a chance that they'll just zip right out of the liquid and leave the liquid behind. So there's some minimum amount of energy, a minimum amount of energy, needed to escape the liquid. And this is what causes evaporation. This small number of molecules that has just enough energy to actually escape the liquid and become vapor. Now something interesting happens when these molecules actually leave. When these high energy molecules leave the sample, it actually shifts the average kinetic energy lower because you're getting rid of the very high numbers. So it drops the average. By dropping the average, the temperature drops as well. So evaporation has a cooling effect on a substance. Now let's say these gas molecules are escaping the liquid. So I've got a couple gas molecules right here above the liquid. They've escaped the surface of the liquid and they're all moving in random directions just like gases normally do. They're going all over the place. And because they're moving all over the place they can collide with things. And those collisions cause pressure just like any other gas would cause pressure. So the vapor that's produced above a liquid due to evaporation generates its own pressure and we call that the vapor pressure. So let's take a closer look at that cup of water. Here's the surface of the water and here are all the molecules near the surface. So as molecules escape the liquid we start getting vapor molecules that exist right above the liquid. Now some of them may eventually leave the container altogether but for a while there may just be some floating above. And they're generating vapor pressure. Now you may think, well as time goes on, why aren't there just more and more molecules escaping? 
Why doesn't vapor pressure just keep getting larger and larger and larger the more time you leave this cup sitting outside? Because the more time you allow the cup to sit outside, the longer evaporation will go on for, and you'll get more molecules sitting above the liquid. But what we see happen isn't the case, because as you increase the number of molecules right above the liquid, you also increase the chance that some of these molecules will impact the liquid and return to the liquid, leaving the vapor. So some of these have a chance of re-entering the liquid or getting recaptured by the liquid, and so they're no longer in this vapor phase. But eventually, what you'll see happen is that there's a balance. As molecules leave, other molecules get recaptured, and we end up with a fairly steady number of water molecules, vapor molecules, sitting right above the liquid. And that results in a pretty constant vapor pressure. So at this balanced state, where the number of molecules leaving the liquid by evaporation equals the number of molecules being recaptured by the liquid. That's the point where we measure vapor pressure. And vapor pressure is influenced by two things. The first is temperature. If you increase temperature, you increase the number of molecules with available energy to escape the liquid. That will cause the vapor pressure to increase if you increase the temperature. So if temperature goes up, vapor pressure will rise as well. The second factor that can affect vapor pressure is intermolecular forces. And in fact, you can use a measurement of vapor pressure to evaluate the intermolecular forces of a given substance. Let's think about what the effect of intermolecular forces would have on vapor pressure. Intermolecular forces hold molecules together. So a substance with a high intermolecular force of attraction that substance would have a harder time letting molecules escape, and that would result in a lower number of vapor molecules right above the liquid. So if intermolecular forces are high, then the vapor pressure is going to be low. Let's take a look at some examples of substances and their vapor pressures. Here we have a pretty typical looking vapor pressure curve for several substances. There's one for diethyl ether, there's one for ethyl alcohol, and there's one for water. There's also another substance down here, but we can't see the curve too much, so we'll focus on talking about these three substances for now. Now this graph may look overwhelming at first, but basically it compares vapor pressure of a substance to the temperature that that substance is at. It also has a line running across at a certain level of pressure, and that represents standard pressure. Now let's look at what kind of information we can get from this graph. Diethyl ether is a nonpolar molecule. Ethyl alcohol is a polar molecule with one hydrogen for hydrogen bonding. Water is a polar molecule with two hydrogens for hydrogen bonding. So right away you should start to get an idea that the nonpolar molecule has the least amount of intermolecular forces. So this is the least IMFs. Whereas water has the highest intermolecular forces, the strongest intermolecular forces, because it has two hydrogens that it can do hydrogen bonding with. And then this ethyl alcohol substance only has one hydrogen for hydrogen bonding, so it's pretty strong compared to diethyl ether, but not as strong intermolecular forces as water. So this will be our medium intermolecular forces. This is of course relative to the other two substances. So to get a sense of how we can use this graph, let's pick a temperature. Let's pick 20 degrees. And we'll compare these three different substances at 20 degrees. So if we draw a line going straight up from 20 degrees, that line crosses the three different curves at different points. So at 20 degrees, the nonpolar substance has a vapor pressure a little under 500 torr, estimated of course. It's a little less than 500. The ethyl alcohol that had medium intermolecular forces has a vapor pressure all the way down here, say maybe 50 torr. And you can clearly see that the water curve crosses right here, and that's close to zero torr. And you can repeat this process for any one of these temperatures, and you're going to see the same thing. That at any given temperature, the substance with the least amount of intermolecular forces has the highest vapor pressure. And it has a high vapor pressure because it's unable to hold on to its molecules through intermolecular attractions. That wraps up our lesson on evaporation and vapor pressure. 
Write down any questions you have in your notes and bring them with you to class.